breathe with me so I don't feel like I'm the only one that ran a marathon just now. <laughs> it's like the time that I was in, thank you, uh, it's like the time I was in university and I was asked to sing the national anthem for a volleyball game that I was playing in. It's like, oh, say, can you see? Okay. Yes, totally didn't work very well. I didn't plan to paint with my arm, but the music was just that good. Okay, if you haven't noticed, I'm not your typical speaker for the day. And that's why you're gonna love me, and we're gonna have a lot of fun in the next, oh my minutes, help me out, or else I'll just keep talking. <laughs> so, today I'm gonna be talking about creativity and authenticity. And I was so pumped in the other sessions when other people have analog hearts like me, because my notes are on paper. Um, anybody else just love analog life and have an analog heart and just are grateful for the technology but at the same time just love that heart to heart that you can have with analog living. Okay, I'm almost there. I'm, my cardio, just give me one more second. <laughs> just take a deep breath. We all need oxygen. Okay. So like they said, this will be auctioned off later. I've never done this painting before. Never tried it. I love the thrill of just painting and not having a clue how it's gonna turn out and just feeling the music and the vibe of an energy of the room. Normally I do paint with a larger size canvas. However, I was thinking about the look on the Uber driver's face when you attempted to get in with a larger size canvas and for your own safety and security, I thought I'd just spare you the details of what it looks like to put in a 1.2 square meter canvas into the back of an Uber. I'll keep it simple. Sorry for the blonde, I know it's really confusing in this photo. Two weeks ago, that's what I looked like, for the most part. And then my, my wife and I were watching a movie and the actress had black hair and was really cute. And she looked at the screen, then looked at me. <laughs> and I was like, we're going to Priceline, we can die. I was like, what? All my branding is in blonde. <laughs> but she's the boss. Creativity is a born talent. Authenticity is a daily choice. For the past two years, I have been speaking on how we're all born creative. That every one of us has 100 million brain cells and we're all just born creative. And I was proven wrong when my wife looked at me and said, Sarah, for the past two years, you've attempted to be funny. <laughs> and your kids and I don't find you funny at all. Yeah, you keep trying, but we're not laughing. I'm born funny, you're not, just accept it. And so I was really, really bummed, but at the same time I just understood the fact that, okay, maybe there is some truth to that. She's way funnier than me, and you'd probably have a lot more laughs on stage if she was standing here rather than me. But, I've got the microphone. I know, aren't they cute? I always swore when I was watching documentaries and speakers throughout my life that I would never put my own kids on screen because I think everyone's really lame when they do that. They're a bit older than this now and would shoot me if they saw this photo, but it was a lot cheaper with copyright laws these days for me to just insert their <laughs> picture instead of Googling something else. I realized that it's probably really difficult to take someone serious when they're wearing this with statistics, static, the statistics, thank you been starting on that work for 20 years. <laughs> and so instead of you trying to look at me and go, oh my God, a wiggle's trying to give me information. <laughs> and I do realize that the human brain can only retain two to three bits of information in a, like, a conscious way. And it is three o'clock in the afternoon and you've had more data thrown at you than any time probably on a Monday in quite a while. I will just spare you too many statistics. Did I get it? Yeah. Great. And we'll just have some fun this afternoon. Sound good? Okay, you're awake. Yay, someone had four coffees. Fabulous. <laughs> so apparently, the one stat I will share with you is in 1968, George Land did a study. And they researched a group of five-year-olds, 10-year-olds, and 15-year-olds. 1,600 of them. And what they found was that the five-year-olds, like you see behind you, that one anyway, rated 98% in the genius level of creativity. Whereas the 10 year olds, 30%, the 15 year olds, 12%.
And what that research showed was that as we age, we lose our ability to think divergently. Because when you're a kid, sure, a nappy box is like the coolest costume ever. And your thoughts are free flowing. And instead of thinking why, they're thinking why not. When they hear a question, they have a billion different possibilities of answers. If you were to hand them an object and say, what do you think this is, they'll come up with stuff you've never even thought of. Whereas the older we get, we're in school. And what are we taught in school? How to think convergently, right and wrong. We're given exams, and even when it's an essay-type exam on a poem, that they say, oh, just give us your personal input. Yet they still have a red pen telling us what we did wrong with our personal thought process on a poem. And so what the researchers decided was, yes, convergent thinking is important, but the power of not losing that divergent, fun, childlike way of living is vital to being creative. And CEOs these days are placing more and more emphasis on creativity, and we've heard that throughout the whole day. You're hearing it constantly. It's like the buzzword, creativity is a stepping stone to innovation. We need more of it. And they'll like outfoot their offices with playrooms and all this stuff, but if you ask most employees, are you given enough time to actually play in those playrooms? Do you feel like you're given enough time to be creative? Most of them will say no. There's a bit of a, a crux between what's needed and what's said and what's really happening, but I think, and you probably agree with me, is that thankfully the steady shift and the pace at which we're seeing more and more people being embracing of their creativity and that time being allowed is steadily improving. I do team building, so I can see this in my day-to-day -day work as well as companies are actually hiring me more and more to do painting sessions with their employees. Now, it was really funny recently, I did one with one of the top building property owners of Sydney, and they had their accountant there and everybody there, it's like 50 of them, so I hired some professional artists to help facilitate. And I gave this accountant a piece of watercolor paper, and she carefully <laughs> did it. Guess what she painted? A calculator. <laughs> so I gave her another piece and a glass of wine. It's like, okay, just unleash your inner child, have fun. A bigger calculator. <laughs> Here, have another glass of wine. Let's just, let's just take this up a notch. Come on, come on. And she wrote, Tax Act of 1996. <laughs> I was like, okay, we got, we got somewhere. You didn't write just numbers. We're like, okay, we're just getting there. We just need, we need a few more sessions with you. But she had a, a whole lot of fun. And so what we're just seeing is that more and more people are placing a beautiful emphasis on embracing your creativity. Uh, this one was taken when I was painting in Vietnam with some students and it's just amazing because throughout the different parts of the world, creativity is seen in different ways. Sometimes it's embraced in more Western societies. I'm finding that there is a, a wider embrace of it in a way when it comes to school and education and parents and, being encouraging of that. I was grateful that my parents let me have an art degree, whereas a lot of my classmates were like, my dad's not supportive of my dreams because he doesn't think I can make a living. And there I was in 2003 with this beautiful BFA in studio art, and I looked at my art friends and I was like, did we learn how to make a living with this degree? All of us became waitresses. And after about six months of waitressing, I thought I'd rather starve to death painting than serve one more plate of food. And so I uh, went to a venue and I said, look, I've never heard of this, I've never seen it done before, but I really like entertaining people and I like painting. So how about the next time a musician's in town, I'll just paint off to the side while they sing and see what happens. And they go, well, I've never seen that done before, but okay, and they took a risk on me. And it was the best thing that ever happened to me with 4,000 people at my first event. I just about shat myself. So you can imagine I had three huge canvases and no clue what I was doing. It was one of the most exhilarating things, kind of like skydiving, had no clue if it was gonna work or not. And it gave me this adrenaline rush. And I just share that with you because a lot of people go, well, how did you get into it? And that's how I did. I had no clue what I was doing. I just went from that to bars, to schools, to universities, to corporate events, and it just has steadily grown. And it's been a wild, wild ride. Now, 
the left and right side of the brain. For years and years, people have been talking about how there's, you know, people are more right-sided or left-sided and blah, blah, blah. Thankfully, science has caught up to the fact that it actually has debunked this theory, and it takes both the left and right side of the brain in order to make a thought. For instance, let me just check my stats before I get this wrong, because that would be really funny. The left side of the brain is where speech is, but the right side of the brain is where intonation goes. So they connect, and oftentimes, in order for the scientists to come up with their right, really great equations, they have to connect with the other side of the brain in order to make that happen. So you can no longer use that excuse. It's been debunked. So if you've used it before, just stop. Be like, don't keep leaning on this excuse that you're not creative, because yes, there are people that are more born creative, but it can be kind of like a garden. It can be grown and cultivated in bits and pieces. They, when they did this test, have you heard of, has anyone heard of the spaghetti marshmallow tower experiment? It's hysterical, you have 18 minutes, you should try this with your workplace, and you get 18 pieces or 15 pieces of spaghetti, a yard or meter of tape, of string, and a marshmallow. And with that 18 minutes, you and your team have to try to compete against one of their teams in your office and build the tallest tower to support that marshmallow. Now they did this with people that had just graduated with like PhDs in architecture and stuff. And they also did the test with kindergartners. Which one built the tallest tower? Kindergarten. Why? Because the PhDs were so focused on having the thought process talked out of what will work and the stats and, and how it will be. And they spent 12 minutes talking it out, trying to figure out what would be the best way. Whereas the kindergartners, they don't know what the crap they're doing. And they just start building and building and they make about five or six structure attempts to the one of the PhDs. They just keep playing. That art of playing, we've heard throughout the day, is so vital to being creative, curious, and brave. So be like a kindergartner. Don't try to overanalyze everything. If I had five minutes and overanalyze this, I'd still be standing in front of a blank canvas. Part of the fun about speed painting is I don't have time to think and analyze if I did it right or wrong. It gives me that freedom to think divergently. To go, will blue work here? Does it mix with this color? Oops, no it doesn't. Learn in the process. Now there's over a hundred definitions of creativity, but my absolute favorite one in the whole world comes from Elizabeth Gilbert. You might have heard of her from Eat, Pray, Love. She also wrote my favorite book, which I wish I had written, called Big Magic. Has anyone else read that one? It's fantastic. And in it, she breaks down the definition of creativity to basically the relationship between a human being and the mysteries of inspiration. It's that simple. We try to complicate it, we try to puff it up as to a separate part of society, as to like, you know, the Da Vinci's and the Michelangelo's and the Banksy's, Lady Gaga's. But it's really you, yourself, and just those moments of daydreaming and wonder. One time I walked into my daughter's bedroom when she was about five years old, and I said, hey baby, you wanna come in? And she interrupted me, shh, I'm trying to daydream. <laughs> I'm daydreaming, but just go away. And I just laughed, I felt like, okay, parenting job is done, tick. And I quietly closed the door, and still to this day, she's nine now, and she just gets in these own little quiet spaces and I just let her be. And it's beautiful because her backpack, she'll come home and in her lunchbox there's pebbles and rocks and twigs and ants and God knows what type of science project she's trying to create in her backpack, especially after um, school holidays, let's not go there. If you don't check their backpacks, it's gonna be really bad. <laughs> check them before school holidays start. And then Elizabeth Gilbert goes into probably something that is, might as well be tattooed on my skin. I think about it daily. And that is a, a creative life is one where we're driven by curiosity rather than fear. 
My career began thanks to me being curious. And I decided I was going to take a leap of faith and not let fear invade it, which made an incredible career. And soon you'll hear how that didn't lead to the greatest personal life because I made fear-based decisions rather than curious-based decisions. Living a life of curiosity, living a life where you're brave is your motto and where you're not afraid to fail means we often have to step out of our comfort zones. Brene Brown, I love the way she has taken the that question where we've often heard, what would you do if you knew you could not fail? And she tweaked it and she says, well, what's worth doing even if you were to fail? What do you have such a passion for that you don't care if you fail or if you succeed? Richard Branson, he um, has more success than just about anybody I know, and I bet on most of our bucket lists it would be to have a cocktail with him on his little island. <laughs> but uh, he had over 600 businesses that failed. 600! Most of us would give up after two or three and be like, oh, screw it, this is too hard. And he was like, nope, they're learning lessons. It's kind of like the famous painter that calls his mistakes happy accidents. That's what I find my little stuff. People are like, what do you do on stage when you mess up? I just pour some more paint over it, just keep going and make it look like it was supposed to happen. It became a cloud, it became a tree, and it to completely change altogether. So, curiosity. I don't know um, who else was an 80s kid, but I was really into Alice in Wonderland. And curiosity often leads to trouble was the phrase that we'd hear over and over again, and it had like a negative kind of twang to it, and it was a fearful thing, but thankfully that definition is changing. I did this painting in 2017 when I was going through the most tumultuous time of my life. For 20 years, I had been living a lie. Simon Sinek says, if you are a different place at work than you are from home, then in one of those two places that there's a liar. And for 20 years, I had, in my personal life, lived a fear-based life. I had allowed my family and my culture and my society to tell me I couldn't be who I was or I would burn in hell. Yes, I was born in the buckle, or I was raised in the buckle of the Bible Belt in South Carolina, where there's more Christians there than there are people. <laughs> and I was told to be gay, I would be Basically, my life had no purpose or meaning and I couldn't do it. So me trying to do the right thing, convergently thinking, I spent 20 years of my life denying who I was, married a man, had children, and was wanting to blow my brains out every single day. I wondered why my business wasn't thriving. I wondered why my speaking wasn't taking off. I was trying to separate the two. But when you're miserable at home, and when the kids are fighting and I would open up the fridge door and hide behind it and grab the bottle of wine and drink half of it as fast as I could to cope. I'd smoke weed to try to get into an alternate state of mind to handle being in a straight relationship. Within a few years, I was diagnosed bipolar and they just threw some more meds at me, which made a great cocktail between all the drugs I was doing and the alcohol. It was very difficult to be present But then, thankfully, I had a few friends that said, Sarah, guess what? It's the 21st century, you live in Sydney, Australia, and it'd be better to be a gay mom than a dead one. Fair enough, right? So the, the, the main crux, the main trigger for me to step out and finally be brave and be free was me going, well, what if? What would my life look like if I wasn't afraid to fail? A failed marriage, failed mother, whatever my family would say that I was failing at. And I watched the movie The Greatest Showman on December 26th on Boxing Day when it came out. And my husband at the time and my two girls watched it. He saw a completely different movie than I did. He saw a creative couple with two beautiful girls living their creative dreams. Guess what I saw? 
I saw the bearded lady. <laughs> and I saw her sing on stage with a big smile on her face. This is me. And she wasn't afraid, or she wasn't ashamed of who she was. And I thought, huh, if the bearded lady can get on stage and not be ashamed of who she is, what's stopping me? And I listened to that soundtrack over and over and over. And within a, about six weeks, I met a woman. And I just knew. And my soul, my spirit, everything just knew. And I went to my husband and said, I don't want to cheat on you. I met my wife. I love you. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> and it was, I had dreamt of this moment for 20 years of being me. And it was the most exhilarating thing. My psychologist was so confused. She's like, maybe it's just uh, just like a, like a, you know, your bipolar thing is just relapsing or something. I was like, no, I don't need my meds. I don't have racing brain. I'm not suicidal. I don't feel like I need to shop. I'm fine. I'm not like up and down like a whirlwind. It was incredible. I was able to jump in the ocean and not feel the cold water like I used to. It affected every part of my life. I was able to drive in the city of Sydney, which normally scared the shit out of me because my American brain was still kind of like, can't we just turn left on red? <laughs> Yeah, I didn't know that was a rule here for about four years, and I just kept, you just stop and turn left, right? Nah, it's, it's amazing what rules don't apply to both countries. And fear left me in every aspect of my life, and within a few months, I was on the news with my story, and then my painting started to auction for 20 to 50 grand, and I was like, oh my God, the power of authentic living is unbelievable. When you are who you are at home and in work, you don't have to try to guess who you are. You don't have to like, weed through the lies. You're able to be mindful and be present. You're not, your brain doesn't race. I was talking with ladies at the lunch and we're always talking about how busy we are. My life has completely changed since then. At night, guess what I do? I turn my phone off. <gasps> And I sit on the bed with my kids and wife, and we just chat. And we just talk until I'm about to pass out and ask the kids to go to sleep because mom wants to go to bed at, you know, like 9 o'clock. But it's so incredible when you're present and when you really are who you are. So I just want to share um, just a few things on authenticity and just have you think about it, whether you're flying back home or whether you live here, whatever industry you work in. There's nothing more powerful than just kind of sitting and thinking about who am I really? I mean, when we are on our deathbeds, are we really going to think, oh man, I wish I had gotten more presentations done. I wish I'd done some more events. I wish I'd ticked a few more things and got a few more trophies. No. <laughs> We're going to be thinking about all the relationships we wish that we had invested into. We all know this, but how often do we really kind of just stop the crazy windmill of life and go, no, I'm really just going to be present. I've never done less in my life than I do now, and yet my life is like 10 times more successful. When I could be working, I'm like, wait, it's sunny. I'm going to go to the beach. What a concept. I've never just taken that time for myself. I always had to, my worth and my value was placed completely on my productivity. Is anybody else like that? Or is like your self-esteem is based on how much of a to-do list? Like do you, oh, do you like do the to-do list and check it off and then if you do something that wasn't on the to-do list, you add it just so you have an extra box to tick? Is anybody else like that in the room? I so am like that. Okay, I'm the only asshole in here, okay. But Brené Brown, she also says that authenticity is a collection of choices that we have to make every day. It's about the choice to show up and be real, the choice to be honest, the choice to let our true selves be seen. When I finally wasn't ashamed of who I was, and I didn't care if I walked down the street with my head held high and just being proud of my sexuality, and I was allowed to be vulnerable, I let myself be vulnerable with people, it was unbelievable the responses I got. I had people emailing me from around the world saying, I've heard about your story, I'm in the same situation, I'm in a marriage I shouldn't be in, I've got a couple kids, you've given me hope. And you'll be surprised at how much you living your life true to you will open the door for somebody else to be themselves. 
it's just like one door after another is like this, I think there's this, uh, I don't know about you, but I feel like the snowball is happening throughout society where people are going, wait, we have seen enough bullshit. We have seen enough people faking life, enough of the whole like, what's it called when you take a photograph and you like tweak it to make it look really good? You know, take away the wrinkles? Photoshop. We have photoshopped our lives so much that we don't even recognize who we are. And I think if we just take some time and just go, you know, I'm just gonna rest. I'm gonna figure out who I am. I did this painting, it took 100 hours. For me, that was a lifetime. <laughs> it took me forever, but in this process of doing about 30,000 dots of energy and just life and love, that's how I found who I was. It was right after I finished this painting that I, I left my marriage and became me, is what I needed. So you think about you. What would you need to do to just kind of cultivate and figure out and weed through all the layers of lies or layers of excuses or layers of guilt, layers of shame, layers of victim mentality, whatever it is, it could be small. It could be something so tiny, but it's hindering you from living your best life. You can go to all the conferences you want. You can listen to all the big speakers in the world. You can listen to all the podcasts. I love Oprah Soul Sessions, how about you? <laughs> you can do all the mindfulness techniques, but at the end of the day, if we don't actually use the information, and use what the world is, we're blessed with having all this technology of podcasts and YouTube and all this stuff and we just still wake up the same way we do every single day. We'll be freaking miserable. Part of the power of living a life of curiosity is just tweaking your day and doing something different. Usually I end the day with a movie, laying down, chilling with the puppies on my lap. You know, that sort of night. And last night, my wife was like, let's play cards, listen to Italian music, and eat Fruit Loops. <laughs> I was like, cool, we've never done that before. And it just is so much fun to just throw a little wrench in your normal day, do something you've never done. I mean, I haven't had Fruit Loops in like 10 years, and she found that there's this new box called Unicorn Fruit Loops. And I felt like I was seven years old, and it was great. What was something you haven't eaten in forever? Where's a place you haven't been? When was the last time you went somewhere and put your phone in your pocket and got lost? And let yourself just kind of figure it out by asking questions and talking to strangers. Talking to strangers is one of the funnest things to do on public transport. If you haven't taken a train in a, a while, give it a go. The other day I was sitting next to a guy named Jimmy, who's about 80 years old, and he's like, the ladies love my new teeth. <laughs> and he was telling me about what it was like to grow up in Redfern in 1940, where you could buy land, like an entire acre for 25 quid. I was like, quid? What? What's that? <laughs> 25 quid for an entire hectare of land, he said. I was like, oh my gosh, and now it's what? A billion? It's wild. So authenticity. I'm just going to give you four simple steps. Just take photos because I know your brain can't retain one more bit of information, but let's just go with this, okay? So reconnect. Reestablish a bond with yourself. Go for a walk in the woods or in the sand and go barefoot. It's called grounding. Just stand in the earth and feel nature pulse through your body. Hug a tree. I know it sounds really lame, but it's just, it's amazing what happens when we reconnect with nature and just sit in it. That's my daughter at a Japanese garden recently and she didn't even pose for it. She like literally just walked over to it, sat down and did that and I captured that moment and had to laugh my head off because she loves things like karate and when she was four, I said, what do you want to be when you grow up? By the way, it's the stupidest kid question you could ask a kid, but I, I asked them that, because let them, what do you want to feel when you grow up? What do you want to experience when you grow up? Don't ask them what they want to be. Ask them what they want to just, or do, you know, ask them what they want to feel and those experiences, and that will help. Side note, little parenting tip there. But anyway, she, uh, back then she was like, I want to be a ninja scientist. <laughs> A what? You know, like Donatello. It's like, oh, okay, cool. She wanted to be, like, literally, she wore the turtle shell and everything forever. It was great. Secondly, rebalance. Re is it restoring the correct balance to how many is your life completely off balance? Silver and gold are not the highest commodity in the world. It's time. 
Time is the most priceless commodity we have. And yet if we tell our loved ones that they're the most thing we love the most and yet our time reflects otherwise, we can say what we want all we like. But if we're not spending time with them and doing things that make our soul come alive, we're completely out of balance and just completely lying to ourselves. I recently got a paddleboard and uh, I'm almost 40 and I'm not, I used to like do back hand springs on uh, balance beams when I was a kid because I was really crazy like that. And uh, it's amazing how the slightest wave when you're almost 40 can just tip you over and I almost whacked my head on a pole, but it was really a lot of fun and I highly recommend it. <laughs> Realign the third way to find your authenticity. I don't know if you've ever been to a chiropractor, but um, they, I went to this one that was called um, the upper cervical because I didn't want all the snap, crackle, pop happened into my spine. So I just went to this one that says, okay, I'm just going to adjust your C1 and your C2. And that will align the rest of your spine. A lot of times we try to align everything at once and you, you might hear me speak and you're going, okay, I'm going to go home and I'm going to focus on my family and you're going to do this and do this and do this. And it's a bit overwhelming. So just think about the C1 and the C2. Just think about what are two things or one thing in your life that just needs a little bit of tweaking and then get the next one and you'll find that the rest of your spine, the rest of your soul, the rest of your spirit will start to align bit by bit by bit. Lastly, to tap into your authenticity is to refuel. My daughter has, this is my eldest, she's Sela, and she has dreamt of going to Japan for about five years now because she read a book when she was about eight and it had cherry blossoms from Japan. And this year in high school, they offered it as a trip. And now she has sold about 18 boxes of chocolate to start her way to Japan. I'm so happy for her because it's like her soul is coming to life with this dream that she's had for years of going to Japan. And it's just, it's so exciting to watch the next generation tap into this thing of going, I can do and be and live the life I wanna live. And I will come up with creative ways to do it, even if it's selling chocolate during my lunch break. So what do you do to refuel? Some of you might just need to listen to music, go to a, when was the last time you had a massage? Oh my gosh, I had a facial the other day and I was like, oh my God, I feel like I'm 29 again. This is fantastic. And they're like, oh, you can need some more vitamin C oil to look that good. Like, come on. <laughs> You're going to need a little professional help to get rid of 10 years of wrinkles from children. Think about what makes you come alive. I loved how um, I heard from the, some of the delegates today that they listened to the, the, the breakout session with Christopher Kai, and it was all about, um, okay, who told me? I can't see any of you, so it's really kind of funny. But you're saying how it was about being vulnerable, and coming back to telling story. And I think that's so powerful because a lot of us have lost that story. A lot of us will ask each other what we do and we're not really asking each other about our life. And I love how at this conference they've really embraced that and focused on that and said, hey, let's really like get down to the nitty gritty and just be real, be present. I was performing at a conference and this guy comes up to me and he's like, I'm the biggest such and such of this company. And it's like the biggest one in Australia. I gotta get this, he goes, I feel like I'm supposed to talk to you. Tell me why. <laughs> what would you say to that? <laughs> I was like so overwhelmed. And so I just talked to him for about 10 seconds and then he teared up. And he said, my father died this week. I told three other people in the room and they didn't blink an eye and just kept talking like I said nothing. And I gave him a hug and just let him have a cry and just connected to him. And I think what he saw in me was a human that wasn't so wrapped up in the banking industry event, but was just someone he could discuss with, his life, his father. And he told me how he was there at the deathbed. I thought, oh my God, I'm so grateful that I'm not so caught up in work, that I'm more, my heart is more to connect with you each on an individual level and just make you come to life and feel alive and feel creative and feel the purpose and authenticity pulsing through your veins. 
So when you go home, I want you to leap around, not just watch your kids do it, not just observe everybody else living their best life as they watch the podcast and come to life, or the speakers. I want you to do it. You jump with them. Yes, I used to have long hair. <laughs> jump with them. Feel alive, whatever that interprets to you. And I just wanted to thank you all so much for letting me be here today. I really, really appreciate the time, the, the focus. Um, your energy is beautiful. Uh, and I can see a lot of you have taken photos. I don't really have any friends with me here at the moment, so if you tag me on Instagram, I'd really appreciate it. So I can tell my kids why I kind of miss picking them up from school and they had to take the train today. <laughs> but it's been a pleasure. Remember to breathe, be yourself, and throw all the paint you can on your canvas of life. Thank you. Very good. Thank you, Sarah. I love that, that closing note. Throw all the paint you can on the canvas of your life. That is awesome. What a great note to finish uh, our main part of the knowledge program today on.